He's five foot two and he's six feet four. He fights with missiles and with spears. He's all of 31 and he's only 17. He's been a soldier for a thousand years. But I always wanted to be a Marine and I always wanted to experience war. Just glorious, the best of the bunch. You know, the day you went in was the day you were stamped. Uh, you know, you were able to shave. You were a man. He's a Catholic, a Hindu, an atheist, a Jain, a Buddhist and a Baptist and a Jew. And he knows he shouldn't kill. And he knows he always will kill you for me, my friend, and me for you. We lost, they lost, the people that lost their lives, whew, too bad. There were more United States Marine casualties in Vietnam than there were United States Marine casualties in the entire Second World War. The day I left, I, you know, it was like, geez, you know, I mean, somebody's pulling me out of and hell. He's fighting for Canada. He's fighting for France. He's fighting for the USA. And he's fighting for the Russians. And he's fighting for Japan. And he thinks we'll put an end to war this way. And he's fighting for democracy. He's fighting for the Reds. He says it's for the peace of all. He's the one who must decide who's to live and who's to die. And he never sees the writing on the wall. I've been through the anger. I've been through the rage and the sorrow and the depression and the alienation and everything. I'm just bitter right now. We're not the heroes at all, we're the fools. He's the universal soldier and he really is to blame. His orders come from far away no more. Hey, America, look at these guys. Hey, America, understand what's happened. And brothers, can't you see? This is not the way we put an end. isn't over but it is ending it is ending not because of the paris talks or the demonstrations at home it is ending because the largest and wealthiest and most powerful organization on earth the american army is being challenged from within from the very cellars of its pyramid from the most forgotten the most brutalized and certainly the bravest of its members the war is ending because the grunt is taking no more bullshit i just can't take too much pressure from the army what happens to an unpopular officer? A friend of mine, uh, Captain, uh, kind of got shot in the back. I made that film with director Charles Denton in 1970 at the height of the Vietnam War, which I remember as a constant Halloween night, always growing brutally real. On patrol, tripwires made each stone and twig a threat to life. Pulling leeches off each other was a ritual that relieved the hours of waiting for the seconds of terror and with each step calling for a superhuman effort to reclaim a boot from the sucking mud, a hand would reach back, followed by a reassuring voice. Come on, man, let's go. The voice would come from a street corner in the Bronx, a rural town in the Confederacy, a steel mill in Pennsylvania, Little People's America. Last year, a poll found that 62% of Americans believe that Vietnam veterans fought in the wrong war, in the wrong place, at the wrong time, and were suckers. This is a film about those suckers. They made up the greatest volunteer army in history. They came home not to parades, but to a purgatory of silence, shame, indifference. Or they came home in plain wooden boxes, marked this way up, unviewable. Today, there is not a single national monument to their dead, as if America's longest war didn't happen. The right wing insists the war should have been won and blame the veterans for not winning it. Those on the left see them as baby killers and dupes. And those in the middle regard them rather like last year's car, obsolete. This film is about that great invisible army and what has been done to them in order to forget and to rewrite a period of history justifying its repetition. For the echoes of that adventure in which perhaps a million civilians died 
are being heard again today in another Vietnam, where only the geography has been changed and the appetite for war without heroes remains as voracious as ever. This is a purple heart. You won two of them, Jay. And these are your dog tags and other bits of memorabilia from Vietnam, including photographs. What do these evoke for you? What memories do they bring back? Uh, I can't say I'm angry. I'm not necessarily angry, but uh, it brings back a lot of bad memories, a whole, an entire bad period. Not only Vietnam, but my whole military service and years since then. You were in the Marines. Did you always want to be a Marine? Oh, yeah. You, you, you know, it was just expected you had to go in the military. I mean, I wasn't forced to go, but it was just, you know, it was expected. Of course, you, you know, you go right into the military out of high school. It's the best thing for you, you know, mm -hmm. make a man out of you. Then if you want to go to college, you can come back and try that or whatever. But I always wanted to be a Marine, and I always wanted to experience war. I, I was raised on it. I, every birthday, I got cap guns and helmets and canteens, played war all the time when I was a kid. The television was always war movies, Sands of Iwo Jima, Back to Bataan. And I got used to that John Wayne idea, to be a Marine, that's how you become a real man, is become a Marine. Because John Wayne never served a day in his life in any military service, but he's the greatest Marine we have. So when Vietnam started to heat up when I was like a sophomore in high school, I was just, oh boy, this is, you know, now there's a war for me. I can get in there, I can, you know, I, I wanted to serve my country, I, you know, I, <laughs> it's almost bizarre to think about it now. Did you enjoy Vietnam at any stage because you had been brought up to <laughs> no. love war and there no. you had your war, your very own war? Well, see, on television, when somebody would get shot, they would, oh, and they would fall down and there was, there was no blood. You know, I, I just, when I first got there and I saw people torn to pieces and blown in half and shot through the head and I, I was just, I went into shock. I know I did. I know I was in shock the first two weeks I, I was, you know, was in active combat. But that, I just, it was, I couldn't believe it. it was, I couldn't believe that that's what it looked like. And it was actually that nasty. And uh, I came back from Vietnam. Uh, I had a heroin addiction. I uh, was just in the beginning stages of becoming an alcoholic. Uh, I had, uh, my opinion on life itself had, you know, completely changed. I was, uh, I was just disgusted with everything. How did you become addicted to heroin? When I first got to Vietnam, I ran into a guy I'd gone to high school with. And he was the first one that said, uh, you know, if you go out to the bush, which I was going to the bush in a combat outfit, you can't drink out there. If, if you get drunk, you can't function. When I got to my unit, I, everybody, it seemed like everybody was getting high one way or another some sort of drug and uh, I fell right in with the, you know, the wrong, the wrong people. I hate to use that term. They were the right people for me at the time, but uh, they were all shooting dope and, uh, the, you know, it was easy to get, very accessible. Mm -hmm. And I just started from there. Uh, I think I continued with it. I was, it, it's hard to, it's the boredom, the loneliness. Uh, I had never been out of Pittsburgh before in my life other than to go to boot camp and whatever. Mm. And I was rushed through all that so fast, I didn't even know what happened. Mm. And, uh, and I couldn't stand what was going on. Mm. You know, I, it was a way of blocking. It was, it was a way of forgetting. Oh. Oh. Some of the atrocities that, that went on in Vietnam, some of them really shouldn't be told. This is Alonza Gibbs, wounded by mortar fire in Vietnam in 1966 and decorated for bravery. Well, some of the things that really pissed me off is I had, uh, well, I was in uh, Company B, 2nd Battalion <laughs> Infantry. And there we had, uh, in our battalion, we had a commander that didn't know how to call in airstrikes. Did not know. He did not know how to call in air strikes, and he was too proud and too pompous to let his forward observer do it. And he called in air strikes, and a third of his company was either wounded or killed. In order to cover up that fuck up that he did, they gave him a Congressional Medal of Honor, which really just completely pissed me off. And I had friends to die in that, friends to be wounded in that, and some of them are right here 
in Philadelphia, crazy as bed bugs. The treatment that some of the people did to the actual people that we were fighting, uh, I couldn't go along with. I saw people interrogated, and because they wouldn't answer, they were thrown out of helicopters. Did you see that? I've seen that. Um, these these prisoners that, that were captured one time, they've got a, a substance called detonating cord, debt cord. Okay, and I've seen them wrap the debt cord around three guys, and because they wouldn't answer the questions, they ignited it and blew their heads off. Uh, we had a battalion commander named Colonel I believe he's General now. I believe he's a sissy. But anyway, he issued all of his hatchets and offered a case of whiskey for the first person to chop someone's head off. Okay, and this happened. Someone actually did get their head chopped off, and this happened in Ven Ben Cat. And this was the latter part of 1965. And the dude that did it, his name was from 2nd Platoon, B Company 2nd Platoon. And he went in there, and he's so hyped up and actually chopped off a Vietnamese head. You would see some of the guys walking around with ears, you know, as a symbol of the kills that they had did. And this isn't, we're supposed to be the American fighting people. We don't do this kind of thing. Vietnam was a teenager's war. The average age of an American soldier was 19. They were bred mostly on a lethal innocence, which needs simple Hollywood heroes and simple Hollywood bad guys. A faith that says their nation is more virtuous than any other nation. I remember the mother of one veteran saying that she thought her son had gone to fight somewhere near Cuba, where there were communists real close and threatening. When her son finally came home in a box, she hung the flag upside down and people said she was a crank. And when the surviving veterans came home and began to tell the secrets of Vietnam, that it was really a war of rampant technology against people, that collateral damage was a military term for the slaughter of civilians. People didn't want to listen because it broke the faith. And for this, the veterans have paid a price. 60% of all combat soldiers are alcoholics. 40% are drug addicts. 60% of all black veterans can't find a job. Thousands are in prison and their divorce rate and their suicide rate is the highest in America. The report which gives these facts was suppressed by the government because what it says breaks the faith. The politicians never said the war was right or wrong. The politicians never had the guts to come out and either declare war or get the hell out. They were hoping that the war would go away in time and they're treating the veterans, the social war, of the Vietnam veterans. That stigma of the war has now eroded onto the veterans. The responsibility of explaining the war has fallen onto the veterans' shoulders. Those politicians are now retired with big paychecks. Now, who's asking them anything? What guilt's on their shoulder? What responsibility? The problem of the war, the stigma of the war, now falls to the veterans. America is uncomfortable with the Vietnam War, but you've got to heal from that war just like a wound. You've got to scrub it, you've got to debride it, you've got to examine it, and you'll cleanse from it. What they've done with the Vietnam War, and because of that, it's fallen on the Vietnam veteran, is taking the wound and putting it in the closet. What's happened is it's festered. It's festered and it's hurt the Vietnam veteran. You realize we've had 55,000, 55,000 suicides, as many people as we lost in Vietnam? That's an atrocity. 55,000 suicides 55, of veterans? 55,000 of Vietnam are of veterans, yes. Now, my God, how many people have to kill, commit suicide, kill themselves? Yeah. You know, it's myself, my own brother. Um, he spent one year in combat, three years um, with a chemical warfare unit in Vietnam, four years total. I was the um, casualty of the war directly. I came home in a stretcher. I got shot in the back, um, both legs, stabbed in the left arm. I was paralyzed in my right hand with a piece of shrap metal. I was wounded in the uh, neck, the head. 40% of my body was burnt with napalm. I was hurt. I was crushed. Could I explain the war when I come home? No. I remember the New York Times calling me, talking to me, and they said, uh, 
Captain Christian. What was my philosophy on the war? I only graduated from high school, so I didn't know what my philosophy yeah. was supposed to be. I told him that uh, I feel as though we should either fight a war to win mm. or get the hell out. Yeah. With that, I was restricted to my ward. Um, it's restricted to my room as a hospital patient. And here they'd bring me out one day to give me a medal, and the yeah. next day they'd, they'd keep me under restrictions. It was sad. So that was how a captain faced the war. How do you think many of the um, enlisted guys faced it? You look at it. You look at the thing, you think, geez, was there a method for them coming back one at a time? Not like in World War I, where everyone came back in mass and they formed their veterans' organizations. Was there any real madness to the politicians in bringing them back and letting them infiltrate back in society one day in a war, one day back here? How simple it all seemed when General Pershing's doughboys marched home from Europe in 1919. The military parade at the end of war has always been a grand delusion, especially in countries themselves not ravaged by war. Like television movies in which blood and gore are never seen, the parades of the past were great demonstrations of vital, victorious manhood. Vietnam changed all that, perhaps forever, and the longing of some Vietnam veterans for parades and flags can never be realized because they brought home the truth of war. Imagine a parade for them, led by human crabs without limbs, men without faces, men with minds and testicles blown away, Frail young men, addicted and dying from cancers caused by chemical warfare. And behind them, in endless formation, Vietnamese women and children and old men, zapped by the friendly fire of napalm. And who would take the salute for such a parade? The generals? The politicians? The arms manufacturers? Not likely. Last year, the 52 American hostages were welcomed home from Iran in one of the greatest parades of all. It was nicely made for television, in which commercials for Pepsi and Japanese cars were certainly not out of place, because broken bodies and impermissible pain were not on display. Of course, they were officially approved heroes, who would embarrass no one with confessions of guilt or failure. Victory in their case, having been bought conveniently with money. Well, what does a city as big as this now provide for the veterans? The city directly, actually nothing. nothing. The mayor appointed one person What's he do? to be the commissioner yeah. of Veterans Affairs, but he doesn't have an office, he doesn't yeah. have a staff, and there's nothing he can do. I never met Bob Mueller in Vietnam, but I vividly remember him being thrown out of the Republican Party convention in Miami Beach nine years ago in his wheelchair. Bob, a Marine officer, was shot through the spine and is a decorated hero in the John Wayne tradition. But alas, there he was, spoiling it all by shouting at President Nixon that the war in Vietnam could never be won. Bob Mueller now runs Vietnam Veterans of America from a seedy office in New York and with barely enough money to pay the rent, in contrast to the government Veterans Administration, whose enormous budget goes mostly to those who went to war and came back winners. Yeah. Bob, some veterans have told me that people have blamed them for losing the war. That really hurts. Let me give a sense of perspective on this, because it's very important. You know, the whole fervor with which my generation was willing to go fight is totally misunderstood. With the Vietnam era, more than 80% of the guys that wound up in the military enlisted, okay? More than 80% enlisted. In the Second World War, two-thirds of all of those were drafted. So the truth about soldiers who went to Vietnam was very different from what people understood. They understood it to be a drafted war. In fact, you're saying that two-thirds of those who went volunteered to go, like yourself. Yeah, more than 80% enlisted. Right. You know, that point is totally misunderstood. There was a time in 1964, in 1965, 1966, and 1967, where every evening we had Walter Cronkite on CBS Network News extolling the virtues of our fleet in the Pacific and our presence in Vietnam. We had Lyndon Johnson saying, 
hey, we're just about there. We had your Robert McNamara's. We had your General Westmoreland's. America supported our involvement. But everybody only remembers when the Tet Offensive came in 68 and, wait a minute, how come the Vietnamese are able to come into the U.S. Embassy in Saigon when the American casualties were continuing to increase, that America lost favor with its involvement in Vietnam. So we only remember 68, 69, 70, and then we really started to extract ourselves after that. But they forget that for all of those years, it was rah-rah America, rah-rah involvement, and we, accordingly, those of us who came of age in that period of time, went as we felt our obligation as a citizen in this country required. Of course, now that history has had some time to come by, that's all changed. When GIs came back from World War II, they had the GI Bill, which was almost revolutionary. It gave them special privileges in housing, health, and all kinds of things. Now, why haven't the Vietnam veterans had something like that? It's a lot of things, but I'll try and reduce it to its essence. Number one, we did not have a willing base of support to meet our needs, okay? We had spent, I think, $165 billion in pursuing our war in Vietnam. Guys come back like myself, and I required a lot of medical care in the hospitals, a lot of acute medical care. Neurosurgeons were involved, therapists were involved, I needed equipment, I needed a lot of things. The hospitals in this country for the veterans had long ago stopped being hospitals for what we came back from Vietnam with in the way of medical needs, acute medical care. The hospitals are populated now by veterans of the First World War and the Second World War. They have become glorified nursing homes. But beyond direct medical care, the GI Bill, the education program that was afforded the veterans of the Second World War, was very reluctantly brought back by Lyndon Johnson. He said in 1966 that he was going to veto the bringing back of the GI Bill for the Vietnam veteran because it cost. And the way they did it was, back in Korea, the GIs were getting $110 a month back in 1955 when they stopped with the, the Korean veteran. They brought it back in 1966 for the Vietnam veteran at $10 less, a flat $100 a month. That's, that's all, $100 a month. $100 a month, even though a decade earlier it had been 110 for the Korean War veteran. And they couldn't afford it. We had spent a lot of money in fighting the Vietnam War. When we used to petition for health care, for the GI Bill, for employment programs, they would cry poverty. They'd say it was fiscally irresponsible. In 1972, when Nixon vetoed the Veterans Medical Care Expansion Act, he said, I am vetoing this bill because it is fiscally irresponsible and inflationary, all right? Now, can you imagine what that does to a guy like me? I was a Marine infantry officer. I had the battleship New Jersey fire and support of me once. When I went into the DMZ, I had jet strikes, one after the other. I had an hour and a half of heavy artillery, many, many times. It was routine for me to spend $100,000 a day to kill people. Then I get shot in the process, come back home, and my government tells me that it's fiscally irresponsible and inflationary to provide adequate medical care in a hospital, to get a GI Bill that's anywhere near what was given to veterans of the Second World War, or even Korea for that matter, that we can't get an employment program so that we can be on parity with those of our generation that didn't stop their life yeah. to take two or three or four years into the military. You always hear before the Congress, a veteran is a veteran is a veteran. The bullets were the same on Tinian or in Europe as they were in Saigon or the DMZ. Nobody's arguing that a bullet isn't going to kill you just as dead in the Second World War as it did in Vietnam. But what we're saying is all that goes around the fighting, all right, that which you've got to look to to justify it, to understand it, to be able to live with it, it's not there for the Vietnam veteran. And that's why a veteran is not a veteran is not a veteran. It's a different experience. We're just not there. When I got out of the service, I was 20. Yeah. 
And I had a big old fat old doctor sit there and tell me it's no way in the world that someone 20 years old could be disabled. But <laughs> how, how, how does he work that logic out if you just spent two years in Vietnam? Uh, I don't know, but this is what was told uh, to me. Uh, you, you ended up, l let me just jump ahead there. You, you, what, what compensation, what is the total compensation that you now have for all your injuries? I get $48 a month for my okay, injuries. I'll just put that into, into sterling, $48 a month, about 20 pounds a month you get. That's, that's nothing. Right. You know. No, nothing at all. And I just got that in the last two years. You've only um, had that for two years, and you left Vietnam years. 14 years ago. Yes. Yes. What happened to the other 12 years? You've had nothing? I've been fighting for, for compensation all that time. The Veterans Administration isn't for the veteran. It's, yeah. it's not for the veteran. It's for the system. Right. And they give us nothing at all. All Vietnam veterans have been shafted. You know, we've been screwed well. And we'll continue to be screwed. Regardless of whether they're black or white. Regardless if they're black or white or Chicanos, because there was a lot of Chicanos yes. there, too. A lot of minorities were there, and we're all being had. They had uh, no real programs for the drug-addicted or drug-abusing veteran coming back from Vietnam. Uh, their whole idea for the drug-addicted veteran was to get them some tranquilizers, put them on a 20-to-1-day lockup or detoxification, and put them back in the street. And. Um, that was fine that it helped you clean up a little bit and get your health back together again, but there was no counseling. There was uh, nothing at all in that. You know, it was just a period to come in and uh, try and regroup and then go back and start all over again. You were wounded, weren't you? Uh, yeah, I was doing a cut offense of 1968, and uh, I got hit in the back and through the arm. I started working on a statue about two and a half years ago, and I was uh, asked to build it and it was just to make the statue of it. It took uh, two years, and out of the two years, literally about 13 months of the two years, I had worked night and day on it, which was driving my wife nuts. <laughs> this seven-foot sculpture is Mike Salsona's gift to the memory of his comrades. Mike lost both legs and has received no compensation for a lame hand and deafness. He uses his artificial legs often just to conceal the fact that he fought in Vietnam and he walks with pain. The funny bitter story which Mike and his wife Beryl tell about his battle to park his car says much about an attitude which all the veterans have to face. How many parking tickets have you had? I well, what, how, many, how many does this represent? $7,000. $7,000 parking tickets. $7,000 worth of parking tickets. Um, when, did, when did you begin this? this uh, as soon as I got with, home. Uh, <laughs> as soon as I got home, as soon as I had to drive, yeah. Yeah. Um, so what would happen? You would, uh, you would get a parking, parking ticket, ticket refuse and to pay it. pay it. Or not even bother sending it in. Yeah. And uh, then I'd go down the next year when mm. I had to register the car. Yeah. And I'd tell them I'm missing both legs, blah, 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 yeah. this and that, and do a little double talking, and then yeah. they'd give me my registration. Yeah. So after about nine years, mm. the tickets just kept on building up and yeah. building up and building up until last yeah. year when we went in, you know, we gave them the plate number, went in the computer and came out. Yeah. People, you know, you got to be crazy, <laughs> you know? You want to register your car, you always... <laughs> you know, the parking tickets are worth more than the car. Yeah. So we went back and forth, trying to negotiate for about an mm. hour. And then they said, uh, well, look, just get out of here. We, you know, we don't, we don't need you. We're trying to help people over here. Just get out of here. <laughs> so I said, my car's not registered, and I'm missing both legs. Don't you understand? And they just mm. kept on going. And I, so I, I took my legs off, and it was at a, at a desk like this. I took them off. It's and the judge's chambers. In the judge's chambers. Yeah. And the judge and his secretary just, like, they just turned red and left, you know, and I, I took them off and I, and I put them on the desk. On the judge's right, desk? Right, and I was sitting in my underwears, you know. <laughs> and and uh, they came in and they just tried to explain to me their situa situation. I understood their situation, but they didn't understand mm. mine. Mm. Well, I, well, they tried to say, 
pay us even five dollars on that and we'll give you your registration. He said, I'm not paying a penny. I shouldn't have to pay parking tickets. Yeah. So finally they came in and they said, okay, you can have your registration. The parking tickets stay. He wanted all the parking tickets removed. Yeah. I weakened and I said, let's do it, Michael. So, oh, so everybody like talking this. to yeah, him and saying, this yeah. is your best deal. You're not going to get another de deal yeah. like this. So finally we, we left with the registration at about 4.30. Mm. All the offices were closed. The place was deserted. And yeah. we're wheeling him out in an office chair because he couldn't put his legs on. And uh, after that, they removed, well, that day they removed the parking tickets down from 7,000 to 1,000. Mm. And then in subsequent talks with them, they removed it down. I think it's now down to $75, all those tickets. That's, that's that's a great picture. And next that. year, we'll get it down to nothing. To 75. Yeah. Yeah. I had a lady at the parking violations. I told her, I said, look, I'm a Vietnam <clears throat> veteran, this and that. And she said, unfortunately, you were in a war that nobody really cared about. Now, she said that, she said that to me. Not yep. that it really, it, it didn't really bother me, but... So that you should, know, uh, that but keep it to it. yourself, lady. Yeah. Yeah. You know. I uh, was hitchhiking back from Philly Naval Hospital. And I had a cane and my uniform on, and I had my braces on. I had some brace on my arm and all. And a van went past me, and then they stopped about 20 feet past me to pick me up, and I ran up to the van, and just as I got up to the front of the van, they threw all over my uniform. They had Coca-Cola and ketchup and whatever. From, they threw it all over me and pulled away. I think I have a, a silent sense of rage. the need to scream at everyone and tell them, wake up. They're home, they're here, they love, they cry, they feel. They're in pain, and why doesn't anyone care? The first time that I went outside of the hospital, and it was a business day in the middle of the week, and I'll never forget how stunned I was. And I felt like just shouting, wait a minute. It's business as usual. Everybody's going about their job. Don't you understand there's a war going on? One, two, three, this is Bob Mueller at the Republican Party convention in Miami Beach, 1972. We feel that it's our patriotic duty to stop this war as Vietnam veterans we served over there. So we're going to read this statement to President Richard M. Nixon. We have fought in your war and lost. We have been maimed and crippled for the rest of our lives. We have lost many of our brothers in this war. We have killed men, women, and children. Every day we ask why. We cannot live with this. Now is the time for all good presidents to come to the aid of his men. Four years ago, you ran on a peace platform. Four years have passed, and this corrupt and immoral war still goes on. You have lied to your country. We now strip ourselves of those medals for courage and heroism, those decorations for wounds we suffered, we cast these away as symbols of dishonor, shame, and inhumanity, and dedicate ourselves now to the peace and brotherhood this nation once held as its heritage. There was much shallowness and rhetoric then, but the view of authority, the so-called consensus, against which all other opinions are measured as biased or politically tainted, was challenged as never before, both by those who fought and those who did not. For many people in America and Britain, that was the true meaning of the Vietnam years. An alternative to corrupt power and war was seen as practical as it was idealistic. People who went to prison for a principle were no longer eccentrics, but genuine moral heroes. So too were those soldiers I knew who deserted not out of fear, but in disgust, who refused orders and fired intentionally over the heads of an enemy they respected more than their own. But where is that moral outrage now? Oh yes, Bob Muller in his wheelchair was briefly fashionable. Indeed, he was invited to meet Henry Kissinger and the big names in oil and banking and war. David Packard, one of the richest men in armaments, told him, Bob, we're going to help you, veterans. It's almost a year to the day since I had that meeting. I've written him 
no less than five times. I've called his office no less than 10 times. And I have never gotten even the courtesy of a reply or a return phone call. Total, absolute silence. And he promised to help. He promised to help. But for a guy like that, who was the Under Secretary of Defense in the Vietnam War, who was one of the 10 richest individuals in the country, who made his money on defense contracts, and who today is still in the papers all the time talking about the need for a stronger national defense in this country, to absolutely reject any accountability, responsibility, or anything for that generation of soldiers that he was a principal part in sending off to war is, to me, beyond belief. President Carter, when he first came into office, uh, February 1977, he promised in his first fireside chat, the top priority in our job training programs will go to young veterans of the Vietnam War. Unemployment is much higher among veterans than among others of the same age who did not serve in the military. And what's happened? They've been dismal failures. You say you're a veteran when you go for a job? I did it one time. Now I try to delete that part of my life because I think it, that it works against me to say that I was a veteran in Vietnam. The first time Bob Mueller was invited to the White House, President Carter did not appear. His media manager later described it as a no-vote situation. Last year, they, uh, they had National uh, Vietnam Veterans Week, and I believe, I think it was about 400 who were invited to, to the White House. And one, one young man, I think, summed it up, and he said, we're just getting lemonade and, and sandwiches. The POWs got a big dinner. What did the president say to you? We love you. That's what he said. In August 1980, during the presidential election campaign, Ronald Reagan said this. To me, it's the height of hypocrisy for the Carter administration to repeatedly tell us how much we owe our Vietnam veterans and then recommend a stingy 10% increase in the GI Bill. We have been shabby in our treatment of those who return. They deserve our gratitude, our respect, and our continuing concern. Our war was a noble cause. In March 1981, President Reagan asked Congress to cut programs specially designed to help Vietnam veterans find jobs, finish their education, and be treated for drug addiction and alcoholism. A few years ago, after a long struggle, 91 veterans counseling centers were established in the poorest parts of cities and towns, where most Vietnam veterans live, they've become a small salvation for those for whom the noble cause remains a nightmare. Mr. Reagan wants them all closed down. They want America to open up their arms and say, don't go away, tell me about your pain. Bobby's never talked to me. Uh, I think the most he has said was I think in October of, of last year when you saw the, the Life magazine, there was a Life magazine article on, uh, I think it was six, six men who were photographed 10 years ago and they were photographed again in 79. And we were looking at the photographs, we were uh, in a football field and Bobby just started to cry and I, I didn't understand why. And he said, Virginia, just look at their eyes. The pain is still there, the horror. They're 10 years older, but the pain is still brand new. I didn't know what to do, so I just let him cry because that was the first time I had seen the pain. The only reason I believe we've had success in organizing the Vietnam veteran is because of one issue, and that's the chemical that was used in Vietnam to knock out the jungles. And that we can finally say to every single guy that served in Vietnam, hey, listen, you better pay attention to what we have to say, because your life might well depend on whether or not you were affected by this and whether or not you're going to get cancer or a kidney problem or liver dysfunction or have a child with a birth defect. It was the defoliant. It's called Agent Orange. It now seems possible that at least as many veterans and their children may die or suffer deformities as were killed or wounded during the war as a result of a chemical herbicide used in Vietnam. It is Agent Orange, 
and contains a poison called dioxin, which is a thousand times more destructive than thalidomide. Britain still permits the use of this poison as a weed killer. Almost 11 million gallons of it were dumped on Vietnam. This is Khu Chi near Saigon, which I remember as thick forest. Today it's a wilderness with the soil and water poisoned for generations. The spraying was called Operation Hades, and when the first birth deformities appeared, all they did was change the name to Operation Ranch Hand, and the spraying continued. These terribly deformed children were filmed in 1979 by director Michael Beckham and a World in Action team. It was the seeds of this unique horror that the GIs brought home with them. Most of the Agent Orange was made here in Michigan by the Dow Chemical Company, best known for napalm. The company is being sued for billions of dollars compensation by veterans. And although the company says the onus is on the veterans to prove their case, it has brought its own lawsuit against the US government, claiming that the Pentagon failed to protect its soldiers against the effects of the chemical. That's what I looked like when I had hair before cancer. In April, it'll be two years that they, they gave me two to five years to live. And you know, I eventually end up paralyzed and blind. And they uh, projected uh, neurological regression till death. Charlie Hartz was a soldier exposed to Agent Orange. Charlie's imminent death is certain. His four children were all born with birth defects. Is there likely to be another Vietnam? Could it happen to this country again? Yeah. Yeah. You ask Americans today what defines our foreign policy. When is it that we're going to draw the line? And you're going to get a different response from everybody you talk to. If we don't know where we're going, is it any wonder that our allies, as well as our potential adversaries, are confused and with their confusion nervous? This book is a collection of New York Times front pages which trace the American involvement in Vietnam. And reading it now is an eerie experience. The same headlines are appearing today. The same jargon such as escalation and light at the end of the tunnel. The same delusions. Delete Vietnam and write in El Salvador and the stories seem almost identical. Like the politicians then, Kennedy, Johnson and Nixon, the politicians now, Haig and Reagan, see the world in the same arrogant, simplistic terms, speaking of dominoes as if nations are mere blocks of wood, not societies riven with their own differences and animosities. Today, as before, honest men pay with their careers. The American ambassador to El Salvador, Robert White, has said that the war in that country is caused by social injustice and the real terrorists are the regime backed by Mr. Reagan and Mr. Haig, and supported, of course, by the British government. The security forces in El Salvador have been responsible for the, uh, for the deaths of thousands and thousands of young people. Uh, and they've executed them just on the mere suspicion that they are leftists or are sympathized with leftists. Are we really going to send military advisors in there to uh, to be part of that type of machinery. For speaking that truth, the ambassador was sacked. Here is an announcement of US advisors going to Vietnam and of US troops going to protect them. The advisors have already arrived in El Salvador. As in Vietnam, the people who are dying in the streets and jungles of El Salvador are nameless stick figures on the television news or between the commercials in a rerun Hollywood movie. The American veterans of Vietnam have much in common with them, for they too have been declared expendable. Here in El Salvador, that fable line is being drawn again to keep out forces which mysteriously threaten the most powerful nation on earth. Or from the point of view of the people of Central America, there is a feeling that change at last is possible after years of looted economies and American-backed tyrannies. For the US advisors, this might as well be dear old Saigon. As it was in Vietnam at the beginning, the advisors are to shoot back only to protect themselves. 
Uh, but then it's likely that US troops will go in to protect them and to prop up a hated government as it was in Vietnam. Mr. Reagan and Mr. Haig say Moscow is fueling international terrorism, but a report by even the CIA says that is nonsense. The Russians, after all, have their very own Vietnam in Afghanistan, where napalm and gunships and other horrors developed in Vietnam are being studiously copied. And that's yet another brutal irony. For America, the real aim in its latest Vietnam is to stand firm, hang tough in a country where the option is soft, as Mr. Haig would say, and the fodder is plentiful. This is filmed from Vietnam and El Salvador. Can you tell the difference? Now that you're talking about going to war again, now that you've got a draft registration brought back, now that you're talking about drawing the line in terms of when does America go to war, for what reasons does it go to war, who carries the burden of going to war, you've got to talk about us because we're the last ones that responded. Missing from this film are the other witnesses to the Vietnam period, the Vietnamese. We hear very little about them these days and the American veterans speak little about them, perhaps because what was done over there was so terrible that only the victims can afford to speak about it. Such has been the politics of vengeance that the people of Vietnam are now almost completely isolated with only the waiting arms of the Russians to turn to, whom they rightly distrust as much as they distrusted the Americans, the French, the Japanese, and the Chinese who came to their country selling noble causes. So here is the news from Vietnam. In the wake of the war's devastation, there is now famine. Rations are less than even during the war years, about half the food needed for a healthy survival. There is no milk anymore for children over the age of one, and unexploded mines and bombs kill children every day. Like its refusal to help its own victims of the war, the American government has denied all help to the people of Vietnam, and so too has the British government. On the other hand, both governments are building the greatest military machine ever in preparation for a war that may well end all wars. And for that one, heroes need not apply. We were so psyched up during the training that people were begging to go to Vietnam. I believe the domino theory for what they, you know, yeah. Vietnam falls, then Laos will fall, and then Cambodia, and, you know, eventually they'll be, you know, hitting the beach out, you know, out in L.A., but, uh, you know, that's, that's all I knew about Vietnam. How do you feel about that now? Oh, okay. it's absurd. That's ridiculous. I, I don't think anybody believes that anymore. A lot of people know. died for it. They certainly did. Isn't that a shame? A soldier came down from the ambient pool with silence in his eyes. He told 